Well, uh, I started this world in 1936 in uh, Oakland, California. I was, uh, my mother was a socialite. My grandfather was E.J. Sweetland. He invented the oil filter for the automobile. Purolator was his company before he sold out. And uh, back in the 1920s, my mother conned him out of a yellow Packard convertible by threatening to take flying lessons. And uh, she used said vehicle to snag the All-American football player at Cal Berkeley. And uh, I was born nine months to the day. They did things properly in those days. It's a little different now. And I uh, had a great childhood. It could, could only be likened to leave it to Beaver. We lived in a little town called Orinda, just outside the Bay Area. And uh, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, growing up period. And when I was 17, uh, I, I was hanging out with two groups. The, the rich kids in Piedmont, and uh, which was kind of the Beverly Hills of the Bay Area. And then s some folks out on East 14th Street where Helen's Angels began. I sort of fluctuated between both areas. And um, the, um, I just bought my uh, first motorcycle. It was an Indian, an old uh, uh, suicide clutch Indian for 25 bucks. It was in parts. <laughs> and we just put it together and got it going. And, my mother recognized the, the, the negative side of my life and intervened very, very interestingly. She offered me $1,000 if I joined the Marine Corps. She always wanted to have a Marine, you know. So she, the, the lady got three years of babysitting for only 1000 bucks. It was a pretty good deal. And uh, I'll never forget the day they swore, we swore in and she was feeling a little bad, like she, you know, sold her son for 30 pieces of silver or something. And she comes over to the, the recruiter there, kind of teary-eyed. She says, take good care of my boy. And he looked right through her with the thousand mile line stare that the Marines have and said, he ain't yours anymore, lady. He belongs to us now. <laughs> and a cold chill ran through my body. <laughs> And it was well warranted. <laughs> they told us to take a little bag with us down to boot camp. Now this is a very this is a parable for salvation. This is the way I really believe that everybody ought to get saved, the way the Marine Corps does it. And I thought that's the dumbest thing. I want to take a big bag full of my stuff down there. They said, no, you take a little bag empty. And we get down to San Diego and you take all, all your clothes off and you put it in that empty bag and send it back home. And they shave your head and they put you through a shower and a delousing program and the whole nine yards. And you, are, you, you arrive in your program to be trained to be a Marine, knowing nothing, uh, ha owning nothing, and I found that the system worked because I came up from a wealthy family's um, side. There was other kids, most of them were in there. In those days, uh, they did, the Marine Corps did a lot of recruiting uh, at the uh, courthouse. And they had a deal worked out for young guys like me that just come in there and they had like a first offense and they, the judge, judge would give them 90 days in the pokey and three years in the Marine Corps. And their choice. And so a lot of young guys signed up and they went. So uh, then the, the Marine Corps did a wonderful thing. They gave me an all expense paid tour 
vacation tour to Korea, which happened to be a little event that was happening at the time. <laughs> yeah, what year were you born? Uh, 1961. Yeah, I got to Korea before you did. <laughs> I got there in 54. And uh, so, uh, and by the way, that really brings up a great point. You know, two Asian nations had a Christian background. The Vietnamese, uh, the, the Vietnam had a Catholic background, went back a number of centuries. And the Koreans had, were Presbyterians had done a lot of evangelical work. And we saw that what the difference that, that happened between Vietnam and Korea, the Catholics taught their people to say prayers. The Presbyterians taught their people to pray. And the Koreans would get up at four or five o'clock in the morning and pray and cry out to God, intercede. And that's the difference that Korea, South Korea is the most, one of those vibrant nations on the planet today. And one of the most appreciative. In 94, uh, they, they were looking for people that gave, gave, I got an all expense paid tour back to Korea for a, for a whole week and uh, that they were giving to veterans that had served over there. And I'll never forget when I was in Korea the first time, we went through Seoul, they called it Seoul City. And there wasn't a building over three stories high. And now you go, go back in 94, which is what, quite a while ago, and there's 40, 50 story high rises all over in there building air, they're building cars and they're doing everything. It's one of the most vibrant nations on the planet. And per capita, <laughs> they send more missionaries than we do. Um, so, had a wonderful experience, uh, three years in the Marine Corps. Uh, prior to that, uh, Luke, you'll have to excuse me for this, but I was delivered from, I was raised a Catholic, but I was delivered. I got kicked out of two high, Catholic high schools and, uh, in the same year, and my junior year was a bad year. And uh, uh, so I developed Ted Beckett's religion by Ted Beckett, for Ted Beckett, based on the golden rule, if there was a God, he'd appreciate that. And that was kind of my theology when I was in the Marine Corps and during those areas. And, uh, so fast forward, so I get out of the Marine Corps. By this time, uh, my folks uh, had built a home up on Lake Tahoe on the Nevada side from some inherit, my, my, they'd inherited some property my grand, from my grandfather. They had a beautiful home on the lake. It was kind of just out overlooking the lake. And that was now home. And uh, so, Mother realized she had a, being a very wise woman, she had a kind of a restless young man on her, on her hands. And first thing she did was, was buy me a whole ski set and took me down to Heavenly Valley. Stein Erickson was the pro down there then, and the Olympic great. And he taught me to ski. And uh, then she saw that I probably needed a little additional help. And, when I let her know that I had the GI Bill, that was it. A week later, I was enrolled in the University of Nevada at Cal Berkeley, at uh, Reno, Nevada, and uh, taking political science and business. And uh, that was a great, uh, interesting experience. And um, the, the um, I played football at, at uh, Nevada, uh, I wasn't that great, but I did make the team. And uh, see, here everybody's cheering for that. <laughs> uh, 
I got married. Audrey and I, it's, our, it's my second wife. And um, we, uh, I had a little, uh, we moved down to Las Vegas. My first wife was from Las Vegas. Her daddy used to own small gambling joint. He'd been pit boss and all the big uh, casinos. Then he had his own place, and and then uh, her mother got killed in a car that he had actually given to his daughter. He gave her the first, Red Morgan was his name, my first wife, he gave her an MG. She had, it was the third one in the state of Nevada. Whenever he'd win a bunch of money, he'd go down and buy a car and get, get the dealer out of bed at night and go get it. And he bought her a, a, um, a um, um, Jaguar, and she was killed in that Jaguar. Long story short, we moved to Las Vegas, and I had I had a little gambling problem in those days. Uh, I mean, uh, if you, I guess if you play poker for two days straight, that's called a gambling problem. And uh, the trouble is that I'd, I'd won a lot of money early, and, and and that's what hooks you. You know, you think you can always win. But my, my, my luck ran sour there, and I lost everything, and um, ended up uh, losing the house. And uh, so my wife moved in with her grandmother, and um, I realized that I had to get out of that gambling environment. So I wanted to move to Oakland, and I couldn't, I couldn't even call my wife, I'd, I'd call, and, Grandmother wouldn't let me talk to her. And so uh, the first miracle that happened in my life, uh, I was actually sleeping in my car. And they were building Paradise from Valley Road, which is the road that goes into the airport there. And uh, so this amazing thing happened. Uh, I tried to do something that was slightly illegal before and was stopped from doing it. And it's right after this, so I'm sleeping on the, the, this dirt road that they're, they're building, and the windows were all down. And the first thing they do is they take a, a, a water car through and spray everything so that for the dust. And some of the water came in the window, woke me up. And I look, by the time I can get up and look around, the, the truck's gone, not a cloud in the sky. And, I'm trying to figure out what happened. I said, I must have got baptized. So, so I go into a, and I know I need a job. So I go into this uh, truck stop thing and, and ask the guy, uh, get cleaned up a little bit. And I ask the guy for a job. And he says, he says, well, you got a place to stay? And he said, no. And he says, pulls me out a ticket for, they had a little, rooms for the truckers, gives me a room. Said, you had anything to eat? I said, no. He pulls out a, a um, card with 10 meal tickets on it. There's a little restaurant right in front. Gives me that. Gives me some clothes for the uniform. And so I, I learned something from that right now that because I, I had sort of made a repentance just before this thing happened and here was a guy from a big family and everything, and now I tried to do this illegal thing. And, um, and so uh, the, when you take one step towards God, he takes three towards you. So in a matter of minutes, I had a place to stay, I had meals, <laughs> and I had a job. And uh, that was my first big lesson with God. I hadn't gotten saved yet, but I'm, I'm on my way. So I finally uh, talked my first wife into going on a date with me. Uh, got a hold of her and I said, Let's, we gotta move out of town. And, uh, but I didn't have any money. So she said, if, you, if you'll move out of Las Vegas, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. So that was the next miracle. A truck pulls into the the uh, station where I was dumps a bunch of steel on the top of my car. 
And I took it to the insurance guy and they totaled it and gave me a bunch of money. And I just laid down in the back seat and popped the top back out and it was good as new. <laughs> so, so these are early lessons, you know, that I'm learning the prosperity, that God has a prosperity plan, uh, even when you don't have anything. We had some juice in, in Oakland. My dad came down. I was selling encyclopedias or doing something. I was doing sales work. And he gets, he, he puts me in touch with the Kaiser people. And my grandfather had been big friends with Ky Henry Kaiser. They were big friends. And so I get interviews with all the Kaiser companies. But they don't like being told, hey, you got to hire this kid, you know. So the only one that was interested with me, I met with steel and sand and gra uh, gravel and uh, with uh, chemicals and aluminum and all those companies. But uh, Kaiser Gibson was expanding and they, they, they were opening a whole bunch of, they have wonderful places in Seattle and Portland and Honolulu and San Diego. Boy, I was, wanted to take one of those. They, but this is a way to settle their problem of having to hire somebody uh, and get rid of a problem because they were also opening Lubbock, Texas and San Antonio, Texas. And nobody in California was about to move to Lubbock or San Antonio. So January 1st, 1960, I opened up Kaiser Gypsum in San Antonio. And with a stack of credit cards, brand new car, the whole thing. It was a wonderful experience. And um, so anyway, that was, that was first life. My son, my son, Casey, wave your hand, Casey. We moved to, we moved to uh, San Antonio January 1st. Casey was born the 26th of December uh, on 61. And he's never quite forgiven us for that because, uh, uh, you know, you give him one present, happy birthday, Merry Christmas. And, and, and uh, anyway, so ended up having eight children. And uh, then the Lord, uh, I go to this father and son banquet in San Antonio. And um, the... Um, Trinity Baptist Church it was the big Baptist church in town. And um, I heard that they had, uh, the speaker there was, was a, uh, um, a missionary from um, Indonesia. And when I, when I had developed Ted Beckett's religion, I always said I had never seen anything in particular in the Catholic Church that was supernatural. So I said, if there's nothing supernatural about it, uh, you could have your own religion. So I did develop Ted Beckett's religion by Ted Beckett for Ted Beckett. But I said, I left a little caveat. If I ever saw anything supernatural, I'd explore it. And this guy, this missionary was telling about how that they were, the people were bringing and burning their idols and their whole lives were changed. And, They'd been raised up in this system for thousands of years and their lives were changed. And I said, that's supernatural. So I wanted to meet the guy afterwards, but they took him away. And I turn around, I meet this uh, wavy haired pastor who had just taken over the church, Buckner Fanning. And uh, Mr. Searles here has, has met him. He, uh, he was the fair haired boy. He sounded and talked and walked just like Billy Graham had that Southern drawl. So I, I get introduced to him and he is an ex-Marine, just like me, enlisted Marine. So I looked him in the eye and I says, what makes you Baptist so gung-ho anyway? And so he says, well, let's talk about it. So we go out on the parking lot and uh, I, did, I had a pack of cigarettes coming down. I'd smoked one on the way and, and only had one match. And um, we go out on the parking lot and he starts telling me about Jesus every which way known to man. He's, he's really trying, 
he, he tells me it's like heaven's like an insurance policy and it's like this and it's like that and I'm ducking and dodging all these these attempts but he, he's told you know the next marine he wanted to lead me to the Lord so I'm smoking this cigarette the first cigarette now I'm out of matches so I have to butt it end to end so I don't know how long we were there but I went through the whole pack of cigarettes wow. <laughs> and, and as I'm on my last smoke I realize I'm in trouble because I'm out of smokes and uh, I didn't know how to take this guy without a cigarette in my hand so anyway he said something about praying I said will you pray so he says a prayer I grabbed his hand shook it and ran to the car and I get in the car those of you know San Antonio I'm driving down McCullough which is a due north street and I had three things in mind I was gonna I need another pack of cigarettes I needed a drink at the Long Branch Saloon down there and I won't tell you what the third one was but I had all the lusts of the flesh in mind. And um, all of a sudden, I had the service station where I was going to get the cigarettes. And this voice speaks to me and just rocks the car. You, you've been next to those cars, they have some sort of system in it. Just the whole thing vibrates. It's like that. This voice is speaking to me and says, You're a hypocrite. Wow, that works good. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I thought, what is this? This preacher slipped a tape recorder or something in my car. I, the radio's not on. With, and, and I check everything. There's nothing. So I said, what do you mean I'm a hypocrite? And the voice says, because this man has explained to you the ways of God, and you're not going to give it a try. Whoa. Somebody's calling me a hypocrite and giving me a challenge. So I shook my fist in the air. I guess I knew I was talking to her. I says, all right, Lord, I'll try it for two weeks. <laughs> now I've given this testimony all over the world. I have to explain that in America, if a product is valid, you give it the two week money back guarantee. <laughs> and that's what I was giving God. So I got so shook up, I didn't get the cigarettes, I didn't, I just went home, went to bed. Next morning, I wake up and I, if I tell you I'm gonna do, gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. Even if I forget, you remind me, I'll do it. So I'm trying to rehearse the night before and I said, I'll try it. I didn't know what it was. I knew it wasn't joining this guy's church it was something else. I wasn't sure. And so I'm thinking, what, what is it? And this little voice speaks to me, says, you got to be good. Oh, being it is being good. Okay. I wasn't a very good guy. Uh, I can, two weeks, uh, yeah, we can do that. So I cut down on my cigarettes to two or three a day and I didn't hardly drink anything and I, you know, my Marine Corps mouth was the biggest problem. But uh, somehow I harnessed that. And now I'm about, you know, this all happens, dinner was Monday night and now it's Thursday night and I'm climbing the walls, I'm trying to play act somebody that I'm not and um, so I'm reading the paper Wife, I was so good I was babysitting for my own kids that night and I'm reading the paper wife's going to some meeting and this light turns on on top of the paper and it goes if you're a Christian you got to read the Bible I'm like, that's different so I conjured up my own light and I says, I don't have a Bible. I went back to reading the paper. <laughs> light turns on again, says, ask your wife. So she just got the door half shut. Hey, wait a minute. She comes in and looks at me. She's been looking at me funny for three days. I haven't told her. 
she'd had me hauled off to the funny farm. <laughs> she says, what do you want? And I says, have we got a Bible? Well, well that was the last question that she expected me to ask. <laughs> and she looked at me and says, why did you ask me that? And I said, never mind why I asked you that. Have we got a Bible? And she said it again, why did you ask me that? And I let out three days worth of pent up Marine Corps mouth, practically blew the poor woman out the door and said, have we got a blankety blank Bible or not? So she said, well, you know that church you went to Monday night? I said, yeah. She said, well, three ladies from that church came over this morning. We had tea and they gave me a Bible. <laughs> Give me the book. So she gives me the book, goes out. I start reading Genesis. Oh gosh, it's tough reading. Two or three chapters and I'm, light turns on again. Try the New Testament. <laughs> I start reading Matthew. That's worse, the begats. But somehow I get into you know, the storyline, John the Baptist and birth of Jesus and all that. And that's, I'm, I'm, that's okay, I'm going. And then I, then I get up to Matthew 5, 6, 7, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. As I'm reading the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord really opens my eyes and I remember crying out. I know what this guy's doing, he's recruiting. That's what Jesus was doing in the Sermon on the Mount. And all of a sudden, a lifetime of sin. I'd always thought I was a pretty good old boy, but it seemed like every sin I'd ever committed was right there. And I thought, oh man. So, I cried out to the Lord, asked him to forgive my sin. You know, I, I, I ran it, got down and kneeled by my bed. <laughs> it's the only place I knew how to pray, you know. And the anointing of God came in, set me free. When I came back in the, into the living room, it was like I was this high off the ground. It was just, it was a really wonderful feeling. So I pick up the Bible again, and it's like I wrote the book some time ago, and I'm just remembering. It was wonderful reading. All of a sudden, it's open. And that started me, boy, I, I read through the Old Testament. Oh, I love the Old Testament. I, 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 I love the Word. I love the New Testament, too. But it's, and that went on for a year or so. And see, here's the key. If you're gonna serve God, you gotta be obedient to God. And you cannot be obedient to God without knowing his word. Because that's the basis. When we're born again, we're translated into a new kingdom. And we don't know the rules. And the rules are entirely different. In my world, you got your enemy. You made him pay double for what he did to you. New world, you're blessing him and praying for him. What is that all about? You got to learn the rules. And the, the word is where you get the rules. I love the word. Well, that started a whole new program. I am, now I am the most, I'm the first real life sinner that gotten saved down there in a long time. And uh, I'm pressing the, bat, the for prayer meetings, going every time the church is open. Long time, got baptized in a creek. And um, I've gone a little longer on this than I was gonna tell you, so I'm gonna cut to the result of this. So, after you learn the word and you become conversant with God's plan, you find out that the only thing that is really necessary is obedience. All you have to do is be obedient. 
if you'll be obedient, if you understand his word and see, you have to, in order to be obedient, you got to seek him because he talks to those that, 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 uh, that seek him. Well, that began a journey. That was 70, about 73 or four countries ago. And the Lord's done stories on me. I got written up in the Rolling Stone one time. And in another article, the headline was, he does deals for God. And uh, the first deal I did was in Haiti. I go to this prayer meeting. I know this guy's gonna be at this prayer meeting. I haven't seen him for a year. And I said, where you been? And he says, I've been in Haiti. I've been doing things. And he said, uh, and, and I had been trying, I had been searching to, to give to somebody in a missions context directly, not just to an organization, but to, to somebody. And, and, and he said, I said, I pointed right at him. I said, you got the missionary I'm supposed to support. He said, well, he says, I got two. And the, I, if you could take one of them, that would be really great. So he pulls out a little, remember those old little pictures we had, you know, you look it up. And he says, the second one from the left, that's Frank Dumay. So I sent a letter to Frank and I said, Lord's God, I'm gonna send 20 bucks a month. It was big bucks in those days, as long as the Lord leaves. So we're writing back and forth. But then they come sort of double cross you because this guy starts writing back and wants to know when I'm coming to Haiti, you know? I had no intention of going to Haiti. And every letter is at him that I, and so finally the Lord says, to me, well, why don't you check out what it would take to go to Haiti? So I call up a travel agency and they say, they figure out what it would cost. Okay. And so I say, all right, bottom line, uh, I didn't have the money for that. They said, well, no problem. We'll just send you the ticket. They sent me a ticket. Bottom line, I arrive in Haiti with 40 some bucks in my pocket two days after Christmas. And, and um, um, I'm staying with the pastor. They put me in a hotel for one night, it's 12 bucks. And I realized that ain't gonna work. And so I, I tell the group that they have a meeting the next morning, pastor, I'm moving in with you. Oh no, that he's a black pastor. That isn't done down there. And the Lord moved me in with the pastor and because that was his plan. But if I'd had money, you see, I wouldn't have done that. I'd have stayed in the hotel. And the Lord taught me what missions was like. The, the missionaries in Haiti were living high on a windy hill. They didn't have much to do with the. Anyway, that, the, 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 uh, that was started me in missions. Since then, we've started mission programs. We, Audrey and I have a very large mission program in India, state of Orissa. It covers the whole state. It states about the same size and population of California. And we've trained about 60% of the, of the indigenous missionaries there. We have an office in Bhubaneswar, the capital. And uh, we bring new programs over there. The latest one, I'm talking to Charisma, I'm gonna be talking to them tomorrow morning again about their next Bible college being set up in Bhubaneswar, the capital of Arissa. Um, we've set up several programs in India, in, in, in Israel. Israel's my real love. And we have, um, we set up a program called Christian Friends of Israeli Communities. It's about six, seven million dollar budget program goes on. And it's touched all of the communities in Judea and Samaria and given them a whole different perspective of what Christians are like. And we provide all kinds of activities for them. So the Lord has been good. He's, uh, he's, he's allowed us to, to uh, serve with him. And the one thing I want to leave, so, some of you guys are retired, some of you are there. Every one of us has a BHAG. 
a big, in the secular word, big, hairy, audacious goal. We, we Christianize a little bit and say big, holy, audacious goal. But everyone with, is supposed to have one of those. And very few find it. The way you find it is you seek the Lord. And you say, Lord, what is my goal that you... And that's what uh, Rick Warren, a friend, uh, the purpose driven life. What's the purpose? We need to find that. And so there's a, there, for us businessmen, there's a scripture that'll scare you to death. In Matthew 24, I think it is, it's a parable of the 10 talents. You remember the five get, guy gets five more, the two gets two more. The one guy hit it. He said, you wicked, slothful servant. We are saved to serve and God has big plans for us and we must follow through to that service. And so darling, stand up for just a minute. Share what important point I left out and then <laughs> play a, pray a blessing on, on this, this meeting today, okay. if you would. <laughs> she gave me all kinds of notes and I yeah. didn't know. She left out all the important points. <laughs> and, and all of the times God would send him overseas and he would have $40 and God would say, go overseas. And it would be like no credit cards, you know, in those days. You can't fall back on your credit card. And, and he would go and God would make a way when there wasn't a way. He would stay with somebody that he didn't even know if they were there. They lost his clothes and his luggage and that was because he had to take movies in um, Jesus films and teaching films into Sri Lanka and into India. And if he had his luggage with him, he wouldn't have been able to take them. And, and he would go from country to country and he said all of the people, he would live with them, stay with them, they would feed him, they would get him back to the airport for his, his ticket. And uh, it built a faith within him. Um, the full gospel businessman was probably the biggest um, thing. Well, I'd hear, the, I'd hear these guys that couldn't come in out of the rain doing these great exploits. I said, if he could do it, I could do it. And if you see me, because I'm one of those guys, if I can do it, you can do it. Exactly. And so he would, uh, one of the things was smuggling Bibles into Bulgaria when there was the Iron Curtain and they got caught at the border and God got them out and uh, absolutely incredible the way that he released them and they got to the border and got out and they did deliver their Bibles. He went and did The Cross and the Switchblade, which was Nicky's um, story, Nicky Cruz's story. And all- We set up Europe, film teams all over Europe. Yeah, to distribute that film and hundreds and thousands were brought to the Lord through that film. Um, what That's it, baby. We, we, uh, we could go on and on. But you yes. guys can stay for a while. And, and we we and, could. Uh, yes, so I'm going to close with prayer. That's yeah. okay with you. Okay. Well, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Father, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for the way you work through men and women to accomplish your plans and purposes. Father, you're the one that has called us. And you're the one that if we walk in obedience, you'll guide us into what you have for us. And every one of us, you have assignments for. And so we just thank you for using us in Jesus' name. Ted, thanks. Thanks for sharing your heart. Okay. And, uh... Hallelujah.